not to be distracted. As I uh, expressed already, the, uh, the message for this hour is a continuation of last week that we are looking at, um, at what we should be doing realizing the seriousness of this hour. The, um, the situation that we are surrounded by in these last days has been for many years a, um, a serious event. We have been studying that since 1848, the third angel's message has been proclaiming and, has, and has, he is the angel that is to seal the servants of their God in their forehead. And so uh, the work that the words of Jesus in uh, Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 to 30, we, um, we pick up the, the words of Jesus in reference to our time. Matthew 24, verse 29. And there I read, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the tribulation of the 1,260 years, immediately after that shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens and then shall the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So what is the picture that we are looking at here? The words of Jesus that tell us that since the time of those signs of the sun being darkened, the falling of the stars, since that time, we've been living in this space of time which is just uh, prior to the coming of Jesus. That's what Jesus just said there. And if we come also to Luke, Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, verses 25 and 26. Luke 21 verses 25 and 26. And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon. There it is repeated. And then he says that then men's hearts, failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So those words are now uh, clearly um, revealed to us in the words of inspiration by Sister White, and I want to read there from Testimony Volume 1, that we can actually identify the period of time in which we've been living and the events that are in line with, with what Jesus had said, that the, uh, the, uh, uh, the men's hearts failing them for fear and nations being angry, etc., Let's go there from, to Testimony, Volume 1. Testimony, Volume 1, page 268. And there I read from paragraph 1 and 2. Here is the description that we can identify with now in that space of time that we've had since 1848 through to our time. Sister White says, I was shown the inhabitants of the earth in the utmost confusion, war, bloodshed, privation, want, famine and pestilence were abroad in the land. As these things surrounded God's people, they began to press together and to cast aside their little difficulties. Self-dignity no longer controlled them. Deep humility took its place. Suffering, perplexity, and privation caused reason to resume its throne, and the passionate and unreasonable man became sane and acted with discretion and wisdom. My attention was then called from that scene. 
there seemed to be a little time of peace. Once more, the inhabitants of the earth were presented before me and again, everything was in utmost confusion. Strife, war, bloodshed, with famine and pestilence raged everywhere. Other nations were engaged in this war and confusion. War caused famine. Want and bloodshed caused pestilence. And then men's hearts failed them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Can you see what Sister White has just described from her vision? She saw the First World War. Then she saw a little time of peace. Then she saw the Second World War. And after the Second World War, what does she say? And then men's hearts failed them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Ever since the Second World War, the world has been in its last moments. And here we are. The sealing of the third angel's message is nearly over. Have we not recognized the description that is given here in the spirit of prophecy? Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 967, paragraph 8, where Sister White is quoting the angel. Uh, I beheld and I heard a voice of many angels round about the throne. Angels were united in the work of him who had broken the seals and taken the book. Four mighty angels hold back the powers of this earth till the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. The nations of the world are eager for conflict, but they are held in check by the angels. When this restraining power is removed, there will come a time of trouble and anguish. Deadly instruments of warfare will be invented. Vessels with their living cargo will be entombed in the great deep. All who have not the spirit of truth will unite under the leadership of satanic agencies, but they are to be kept under control till the time shall come for the great battle of Armageddon. Have you not seen the fulfillment of, that, of this statement? That indeed the First and the Second World War has happened, as it said there, that nations are eager for conflict and deadly weapons of warfare are invented. Aren't we seeing that? The, the weapons of warfare are getting worse and worse. And so here we stand in this time where everything is heading directly to Armageddon. How close to the end are we? And if we are so close to the end, let's follow some more uh, appreciations here that we are called to pay attention to. And I'm reading through the spirit of prophecy here, so we're letting the, the inspiration of the spirit of prophecy illuminate us in this matter. And that's what I'm saying. This is not me talking to you. This is now the Word of God identifying for us the seriousness and the, and the importance of understanding that we don't become distracted. Here it says on page 118, in reference to this angel that is causing the angels to hold back the winds of strife, and we, we've seen them letting go in the First World War and again in the Second World War, it says, I then saw the third angel, said my accompanying angel, fearful is his work, awful is his mission. He is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares and seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garner. These things should engross the whole mind, the whole attention. Can you hear God speaking? Is this what we are doing? Are we aware fully of what we, what we should be occupied with? And I'm reading there from Great Controversy to further enlarge this for us because here on page 482 
488, paragraph 2, we read, Those who would share the benefits of the Saviour's mediation should permit nothing to interfere with their duty to perfect holiness in the fear of God. What should we be concentrating on? Permit nothing to interfere. That's the theme of our meditation now, not to be distracted. Nothing should interfere with our duty to perfect holiness in the fear of God. There it is. What should we be doing? Perfecting holiness. Nothing should interfere with that. The precious hours, instead of being given to pleasure, to display or to gain-seeking, should be devoted to an earnest, prayerful study of the word of truth. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. We should need understand this personally for ourselves. Can you see the call? Otherwise, it says, if we don't, otherwise it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. Every individual, can you hear what the Lord is saying? Every individual, that means you and me, has a soul to save or to lose. Each has a case pending at the bar of God. Each must meet the great judge face to face how important then that every mind contemplate often the solemn scene when the judgment shall sit and the books shall be opened, when with Daniel every individual must stand in his lot at the ends of days. I just want us to pick up what the Spirit of God is trying to impress upon our hearts in relation to what we read about the third angel. Nothing should interfere with this work. And, and there, this has been the message for over 120 years now to really understand what is our duty to perfect holiness and permit nothing to distract us. Because... Satan knows all this. We want to become very aware and very um, appreciative of what he is doing so that we can be on guard and we don't let him distract us. So there we read from early writings. Page 44. Early writings 44, paragraph 2. What is Satan doing? What are we to be conscious of? At this time, it says Satan was trying his every art to hold them where they were until the sealing was passed, until the covering was drawn over God's people and they left without a shelter from the burning wrath of God in the seven last plagues. So what's Satan doing? He is trying to distract us, see? Uh, God has begun this covering, to draw this covering of the ceiling over his people. And it will soon be drawn over all who are to have a shelter in the day of slaughter. God will work in power for his people and Satan will be permitted to work also. So what is Satan doing? He is using his every art. And this is what we need to become very familiar with now. This is why I'm sharing this message with you. Uh, Satan is, is trying his every art and are we falling for his art? Um, I read again from early writings, page, uh, rather from evangelism, page 357, paragraph 4. And notice here, how relevant this statement is. It says, Wherever there is a little company raised up, 
Satan is constantly trying to annoy and distract them. Can you identify? Satan is there to annoy and distract where the companies arise that wish to remain in harmony with their work with God. When one of the people turns away from his sins, do you suppose that he, Satan, will let him alone? No, indeed. We want you to look well to the foundation of your hope. We want you to let your life and your actions testify of you that you are the children of God. Can you hear God speaking to us? What serious meditations are brought to our attention? What is Satan doing? He is trying to annoy and to distract you and me as we are a little company raised up and God's people in different parts of the planet raised up and he is trying to annoy and distract them. We then read Selected Messages, book 3, page 23, to continue this understanding. Under inspiration, God is speaking directly to us. The Lord would have all who act a part in his work bear testimony in their lives to the holy character of truth. The end is near. Back when Sister White wrote that. The end is near, and how near is it now? And now is the time when Satan will make special efforts to distract the interest and separate it from all the all-important subjects that should arrest every mind and to concentrated action. What is our duty? concentrated action and Satan is there to throw everything at us so that we will fail to distract us examine ourselves closely can you identify what he's doing with your and my life so let's have a look at the detail of these special efforts which uh, Satan is exercising upon us <coughs> What are these efforts? What can and will distract us? What is it that will distract us from engaging with all diligence, which we are called upon to do, intensified? So here we want to read quote after quote and be very attentive to these collections of quotes because they are telling us how <coughs> Satan is working in practical influence. First of all, number one, he, it is our distraction to the world. Um, looking at Testimony Volume 1 and reading there from page 271 in the middle of the paragraph, it says, We are living in a solemn time Satan and evil angels are working with mighty power with the world on their side to help them. What's he doing? He is working with mighty power with the world on their side to help them. And professed Sabbath keepers who claim to believe solemn, important truth unite their forces with the combined influence of the powers of darkness to distract and tear down that which God designs to build up. Professed Sabbath keepers are doing what? They claim to believe the solemn important truth, but they are uniting their forces with the combined influence of the power of darkness to distract and tear down that which God designs to build up. The influence of such is recorded as of those who retard the advancement of reform among God's people. Retarding. As I'm reading this, I, I don't know how, how better we can 
we can uh, impress our hearts with, the, with what we are experiencing at this time. Those who claim to be Seventh-day Adventists, what did I read there? Claiming professed Sabbath keepers. What are they doing? They, they make a profession. They claim to believe. And you can hear them preaching. They claim to believe. But what are they doing? They tear down that which God designs to build up. That's the problem. And this is what is, is distracting so many believers in the three angels' messages. Then comes the second point. I just wish I could delay on each one to really enlarge this in your minds, but I'm praying the Holy Spirit will do that for you. I'm reading now from Council to the Church, page 169. And don't forget, this was written in Sister White's time. What we have today is not just books. We have the internet. We have all the things that come to us to distract us. Follow carefully the principle here in Councils to the Church, page 169, paragraph 6. The widespread use of such books at this time is one of the cunning devices of Satan. He is seeking to divert the minds of old and young from the great work of character building. He means that our children and youth shall be swept away by the soul-destroying deceptions with which he is filling the world. Now, Sister White didn't see what we have today with the YouTube and with television and with um, all these entertainments of what, when they used to read the books, now we watch the stories played out. So, uh, Satan is at work through this to divert our minds from the and as we read there, nothing should be permitted to divert us for this important work. But here we can see very clearly what it is. Uh, therefore, he seeks to divert their minds from the word of God. How important did we see was the word of God? We were meant to be studying it so that we would understand what to do and to identify. But we are being distracted from studying the Word of God. He is diverting their minds from the Word of God and thus preventing them from obtaining a knowledge of those truths that would be their safeguard. So there we have novels or films or videos and all these things that distract us from following through the urgent work that needs to be done right now. And then comes another very important uh, manner by which Satan is at work. And I'm reading here from uh, Life Sketches, LS, LS80. It's, it's the, if you go for the reference, LS80, page uh, 232, paragraph 1, where Sister White is pleading with God in prayer that the blessings of the Lord and the blessings of the Lord rested upon me and she was off in vision. And what did she see? I was again shown the errors of these wicked men and others united with them. Errors. I saw that they could not prosper. Their errors would confuse and distract. What would confuse and distract? What people are proclaiming in the in the teachings of that they believe they're teaching, errors. What do these errors do? They confuse and distract. Are we listening to all sorts of errors that are being promulgated today by those who profess to be Sabbath keepers? Some would be deceived by them, but that truth would triumph in the end and error be brought down, I was shown that they were not honest and then I was carried into the future and shown that they would continue to despise the teachings of the Lord, 
to despise reproof, that they would be left in total darkness to resist God's spirit until their folly should be made manifest to all. Now here comes the important bit of associating our understanding with the errors compared to what? A chain of truth, a chain of truth was presented to me from the scriptures in contrast with their errors. When I came out of visions, and she says then uh, that uh, she came out of the vision and that she was in vision for a long time. But did you notice here? A chain of truth was presented to me from the scriptures in contrast with their errors. So as we are surrounded by Satan and his sophistries, we are hearing and watching preachers with error mingle together with truth. And it sounds so beautiful. Let me just emphasize, remember angel come, the, the Satan comes as an angel of light. An angel of light. What do we expect? These are beautiful preachers. Preaching things to please the ears of the people, but errors and taking away and distracting and confusing us from the pure truth, that pure, uh, the, that pure chain of truth that is going to get us there. That's Satan's work. Then we come to another very important, uh, this is number four now, another distraction that Satan uses. I'm reading from Testimony, Volume 5, page 236. I'm reading there from paragraph 3 and 4. We cannot afford, Sister White, we cannot afford now to give place to Satan by cherishing disunion, discord and strife. This is how we give place to Satan's distractions. Cherishing disunion. That's strange. Do people cherish disunion? Well, they do when they think they are right and the others are wrong and so they, they keep on cherishing this conflict, discord and strife. That's what Satan is doing. And I continue to read that union that union and love might exist among his disciples was the burden of our Saviour's last prayer for them prior to his crucifixion. With the agony of the cross before him, his solicitude was not for himself, but for those whom he should leave to carry forward the work in the earth. The severest trials awaited them, but Jesus saw that their greatest danger, what was their greatest danger and what is our greatest danger in this time? It would be from a spirit of bitterness and division. Hence, he prayed, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Here it is. That is what we are called upon to recognize that as soon as there is any division and strife and bitterness, then we are being distracted from our duty as God's people. And uh, on page 240, I read, Testimony 5, 240, paragraph 3, just the last part there. It says, as pride... I'll just read the next sentence before that. Every advanced step toward the world was a step away from God. As pride and worldly ambition have been cherished, pride, pride of what I believe, yes, pride, the Spirit of Christ has departed and emulation, dissension and strife have come in to distract and weaken the church. Distract, there it is again. We are reading from the Lord, from the words of inspiration, the testimony of Jesus. We are reading what these distractions are. And can we identify? Can we see how Satan is at work? I read another quote now, point five from Bible Echo. 
Bible Echo, September 3, 1900, paragraph 4. This is now Satan again, tempting men and women in many ways. On the right hand and on the left, he works with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. To some, he comes in a winning garb. Listen carefully, remember, he comes in the angel of light. So warm, so nice, so, so beautiful, winning garb, and with a friendly air. To others he comes in garments of darkness to scatter and slay. By torturing fears he seeks to dishearten and distract. Can you identify? Dishearten and distract by torturing fears. He places before our mind's eye things that trouble us and trouble us and we can't get rid of the troubled mindedness. That's what he's trying to do to keep us in a state of distraction. And finally, point six. Great controversy. Page 597, paragraph one. Many are the ways by which Satan works through human influence to bind his captives. Now follow this carefully. Follow carefully and examine ourselves. He secures multitudes to himself by attaching them by the silken cords of affection to those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. They are enemies of the cross of Christ and they are bound to us by affectionate ties. Can you see what this is saying? Whatever they are, now follow carefully, whatever this affectionate tie is, whatever this attachment may be, parental, filial, conjugal, or social. So what is this? The affectionate ties of children and with parents and parents to children. The, the family ties. And then conjugal, what does that mean? Marital. Bound together by affectionate ties with certain individuals, like you have the believer and then the other one, is doing the very things that we've been reading about. Turning, not paying any attention to the strong call for getting ready for Jesus to come. So there is affectionate ties there, conjugal or social, the friends we have. The effect is the same. The opposers of truth exert their power to control the conscience. And the souls held under their sway have not sufficient courage or independence to obey their own convictions of duty. Wow. These are serious distractions. And we are called upon, and young people, as you listen to this, understand what the Lord is trying to communicate with us here. These are not my words. These are the words of inspiration that we are to pay close attention to. And having seen all those points, those six points, Having seen them, we come now to a conversation that Satan has with his angels. So here are now a people, a people who are determined that they are going to stand fast for the pure truth. And he, and he, he can't get them to change their beliefs and their strong faithfulness to the truth. So what else does he do? And this is sort of summarizing a little bit of some of the things we've been reading. And I'm reading from Testimony to Ministers, page 473. He's talking here to his angels. And he says in paragraph 2, Before proceeding to these extreme measures, we must exert all our wisdom and subtlety to deceive and ensnare those who honour the true Sabbath. We can separate many from Christ by worldliness, lust, and pride. 
They may think themselves safe because they believe the truth. But indulgence of appetite or the lower passions, which will confuse judgment and destroy discrimination, will cause their fall. Satan knows it. And so you can see his subtlety. And there we go to page 475 because I'm not going to read the whole lot. He goes right into the detail of all his sophisticated ways. And testimony to ministers, page 475, paragraph 2. What does he now? Follow the coast. What he does. We must cause distraction and division. We must cause distraction and division. We must destroy their anxiety for their own souls and lead them to criticize, to judge, and to accuse and condemn one another. That's Satan's work. Are we aware of what this is in our, in our own experiences? We must lead them to criticize, judge, and to accuse and condemn one another and to cherish selfishness and enmity. For these sins God banished us from his presence, and all who follow our example will meet a similar fate. So important that we are really understanding what we are reading here. And just to consolidate this appreciation, we read from Bible Commentary, Volume 6, Page 1107, paragraph 8. This is another one. Satan will insinuate himself by little wedges. Little wedges. That widen as they make a place for themselves. The specious devices of Satan will be brought into the special work of God at this time. Now, he's been a, a, a very capable person who has done this work in the ranks of Adventism to our time. And anyone today who is still left, who hasn't been caught out, he is working hard. Remember, he is making war with the remnant of the woman's seed. And so... We have successfully kept ourselves from all this. If we have, he could not succeed in all these things if we're still holding on to the, what we should be doing and we're not letting these things affect us. What does he do next if he can't get his way? What does he do next? Early writings, page 44, paragraph 1. Here it is. Some of these agents of Satan were affecting the bodies of some of the saints. Who? Those ones that he, he could not deceive and draw away from the truth by satanic influences. So all those people that have successfully come through all those challenges that I've been reading, and they won't be affected, so he now says, okay, well, we'll really give them a hard time bodily. Affecting their bodies. You know the story well, don't you? Job 1, verses 6 to 12, and Job 2, verses 2 to 7. What do we remember there? Satan comes and, and says, you know, Job is such a faithful person. And, and God said, and he said, just take away all his, his success, etc., etc., and 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 he, he, he managed to destroy all of Job's property, etc. But that wasn't good enough. He finally said, well, you've got to, yeah, you've got to deal with him so, so well because he's still well in his body. So what does he do? He touches his body and gives him severe boils. He couldn't, he couldn't cause Job to fail in any other way. Now he put him through this terrible experience. So we read from Councils to Parents and Teachers, page 317, paragraph 3, where it says, 
They will meet with trials. Discouragements will press upon them as they see their work unappreciated. So Satan's doing all this and then trying to discourage. Satan will strive to afflict them. What is it now? Satan will strive to afflict them with bodily infirmities. Wow. Bodily infirmities. Do you wonder why sometimes you're physically not well? Satan is prodding you. He's giving you bodily infirmities, hoping to lead them to murmur against God, to close their eyes to his goodness, his mercy, his love, and the exceeding weight of glory that awaits the overcomer. So here it is. He touches their bodies so that they, it, 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 it doesn't seem to be improving, just like poor Job. And, and his wife said, why don't you curse God and die? Yeah? Totally discouraged. He, he said, no, you know, I'm not going to let this happen. Uh, so his, the, uh, this is what Satan wants to do, that they will next murmur against God, close their eyes to his goodness and his mercy and his love and the exceeding weight of glory that awaits the overcomer. Um, to such, at such times, let teachers remember that God is leading them to more perfect confidence in him. Leading them to more perfect confidence. Keep on trusting him through the darkness of physical problems. If in their perplexity they will look to him in faith, he will bring them from the furnace of trial, refined and purified as gold tried in the fire. So it's for character perfection that these things are permitted to happen. So as we come to our conclusion here, we have read the distractions and they culminate even in the distractions of physical ailments. Satan is touching the body. And so as we Consider this, when we have some bodily pains and discomforts, etc. They are designed to distract us. It simply means that Satan's touching you. And you can learn through this suffering together with Job to perfect a character. So, we are called upon in these moments of the closing work of Jesus about finished, and we are called upon to concentrate our every focus upon making our position sure, letting nothing distract us, we must continue to focus upon every ounce of God's wonderful help and counsel. So we are to, to be unmoved, and even unmoved, when we are still suffering disease and sickness until he can restore us or he puts us to rest. But trust him. Trust him by casting your full dependence on him. And that's what our scripture reading was, was it not? Revelation 12 verse 11. Well, how are we going to overcome Revelation chapter 12? We read there from verse 11. And they overcame him. We read verse 10 as well. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength through our Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And what did they do? They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Yes, even if our, he touches our bodies and we die, we love not our lives unto death. We keep on letting the pure truth of God be the center of our attention and permitting nothing to distract us. 
And there we read it in conclusion in Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5, and which connects us also to those words of Isaiah, where he says, I am your God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I am your God. Trust me. Follow me. Follow the counsel that I'm giving you. And here in Psalms 103, we conclude. Psalms 103. There we read from verses 1 through to 5. 103, 1 to 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who has satisfied thy mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. These are the times, right now, so many years that have passed and we are right on the very cusp of the final probation closing. And all that we have studied, all that we, I have shared with you here, is calling us to respond to the appeals of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that we will permit nothing to distract us. I've made my decision. Let us all make our decisions together because I'm setting my face like a flint. I will permit nothing to distract me, even though I'm tempted to be distracted. May God bless us. The Lord be with you all until we meet again. Amen.